right, welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is Tom Pace. Tom is the founder of NetRise, which is a security company specializing in firmware security. Um, we're going to talk to Tom today about a presentation he did at DEF CON a couple of weeks ago in the ICS Village. The talk was on SBOMs or Software Bill of Materials and how those can be leveraged to help improve industrial control system security. It's my guess that these are a rarity uh, among ICS and OT security circles right now, but uh, Tom's definitely going to fill us in and help us learn more about um, SBOMs and how you can help, uh, how you can use them to help address risk in industrial operations, their value proposition, how you can use one, and and a lot more. So um, before we bring in Tom, I, I again want to, my usual spiel about thanking you for listening. Uh, I really appreciate the support on the podcast. I've had some great guests lately. Um, that I hope you catch up on if you haven't already. Uh, they include Tony Baker, who is the Chief Product uh, Safety and Security Officer at Rockwell Automation, and uh, former NSA Director Admiral Mike Rogers. We had a good discussion about ransomware in, in OT. So uh, catch up on those and a, and a bunch of others. Please uh, appreciate you guys spreading the word and subscribing if you haven't already on your favorite platform. Uh, so now let's get on with today's episode. I want to bring in Tom. Uh, how are you, sir? Thank you for uh, coming in. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for having me and uh, happy to be here and talk about an important topic. Yeah. Uh, so before we jump in, let's spend a minute or two telling us about uh, or about your background in your company. Yeah. Uh, so I started my career off in the Marine Corps, actually, doing not cybersecurity things. So I spent a lot of time in the Middle East uh, running around and then um, got back from there and worked at a, worked at a bank in Pittsburgh for, for a handful of years. And then I moved to the Department of Energy, where I did industrial control system uh, security for, for around three years. And it was there that I kind of got visibility to the, to the first uh, inkling of this problem around <clears throat> not having good visibility into these uh, types of devices that serve critical functions, mm -hmm. like I ICS and OT devices and things like that. As part of my responsibilities there. I was tasked with determining the impact of uh, particular risks and vulnerabilities that that were coming out. So things like, you know, heart bleed and shell shock and all that stuff came around. And so, um, you know, I, I found out that it was very challenging for us to really get clear answers on things like, hey, does this library exist? Does this file exist on these, um, you know, very heterogeneous types of devices that were um, serving critical functions? Um, and then I also, you know, to my surprise, uh, found out that it was hard for the manufacturers in many scenarios to give us clear answers as well. Um, now I understand why that why that's the case because it's a huge problem um, that that really, if not solved at the beginning, uh, puts puts us where we are now. Yeah. Um, once I left Department of Energy, <clears throat> I, went, I went to Silence for four and a half years. Uh, did some ICS consulting, some incident response consulting. <clears throat> Sorry, and I eventually left as the uh, global vice president of uh, enterprise solutions. So I was handling ransomware cases globally, um, as well as doing some cool things around the IoT firmware and embedded space. And so at NetRise, what we are doing is providing visibility into a set of devices that historically have not had good visibility. So things like IoT, ICS, medical devices. Um, uh, network equipment, uh, embedded systems and vehicles, things like that. Uh, in the way that we are providing that visibility, um, at least as a as a first step, is by analyzing the firmware of those kinds of devices. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. So, and you guys are have you come out of stealth, or you're still in in that stage? How would you describe it? Yeah, I mean, we're. I guess we're like in um, kind of stealth. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be making some big announcements here very soon um just um you know going through a going through the fundraising process and yeah. all of that so we've been um let's see we've been active for eight and a half months now out there so yeah but we'll be we'll be making some big announcements here shortly about um releasing re the first release of the platform and um you know bringing on uh really increasing the size of the team and, and mm -hmm. a couple other big big surprises that were Really excited to announce and um, you know hit the market pretty hard and fast. It's going to be it's going to cool. be a lot of fun. Exciting, yeah, it is. It's really it's really kind of crazy how it all how fast things go. Yeah. All right, so in my intro, I said that 
S bombs, software bill materials, rare in ICS and OT security. I mean, was that a fair statement? Was that accurate? I mean, maybe we should start there. Like, how many organizations have this kind of visibility you mentioned into the devices that they're running and devices that are really embedded in critical infrastructure, critical critical manufacturing, et cetera? Yeah, I think it's a fair fair statement to say it's pretty rare. Um, I, I wish I had like a percentage or something I could give you. I, I, yeah. I, I really don't. Um, you know, I think for newer things, you have a higher probability of getting something like this uh, because at, people are aware that their downstream clients want these, asset owner operators want these, manufacturers want these, power and utilities want these. So um, as you're bringing like new devices and things like that to market, it's a, uh, it's a much easier thing to do. But as we all know, um, ICS and OT devices, um, you know, have a very long shelf life and, and lifespan out there in production. So you have that problem where you might have something that isn't going to be touched for 10 years or mm-hmm. whatever it is. And so then you also have the problem of like uh, M and A's and companies going under and um, companies being end, or uh, companies, but devices going end of life and things like that. So uh, yeah, the number of folks who have a software bill of materials, I would imagine it's pretty low. And right. then you run into problems around like um, if you can't get a hold of source or, or, you know, some, or working with the manufacturer, then you're going to have a very, very challenging time getting a, a like perfect S bomb. You can get really close. And I mean, that's because that's some of the work that we're doing. You can get, uh, you know, pretty high fidelity information um, over time, but it's, it's just significantly more challenging than obviously if you have source or some other inside track working with the manufacturer. Right. I mean, we should probably kind of define or describe what they are. I mean, they're kind of analogous to an ingredient list on, on food items, right? I know that was an example in your talk. Yeah, exactly. So I used a couple examples for things that we have a bill of materials for. So food, yeah, there's like a you know nutrition and, and ingredient list kind of thing. And so a lot of times the analogy I use is if you were to walk into a bakery and have a severe peanut allergy um, and you wanted to buy like some cookies or a cake or whatever it is, uh, and you said, hey, I want to know were these were these baked goods made near or have peanuts in them? And the and the guy who made them basically says, "Well, I, I don't know. I can't give you that information." Well, now you're accepting a pretty a pretty significant risk by um, deciding deciding to buy those things. So the same is true of of software. Um, and so we have people buying devices and software packages and things like that, where they aren't totally aware of the risk that is present within those things mm-hmm. or the risk that may occur uh, downstream. And so, you know, we have a bill of materials for food. We have it for hardware. We have it for chemicals. We have it for all of these other things, um, but we don't have it for software, which is arguably, you know, the most important thing powering the world right now. Right. So uh, it's a, uh, it seems a bit, doesn't seem to align well. So as a buyer, I mean, do I have to be a, you know, do I have to have deep pockets and some leverage like that to demand or ask for an S bomb? Um, is it a costly add-on? What's the what's the scenario in terms of asking and and getting one, asking for one and getting one? Yeah. So I mean, uh, unfortunately, if the bigger you are, the deeper pockets you have, the bigger stick you have. So right. that, that, that certainly uh, increases the probability of you, of you getting what you want from like a, um, a contractual in terms and conditions negotiation perspective, um, on the, in terms of how hard is it is a, I guess, contentious point, um, in cybersecurity these days where some folks are like, you know, you're, you're going to force security teams to have even more work than they have, uh, than they've had in the past. Or, you know, it's, uh, it, it's really time consuming. If we document all this stuff, we're giving a, uh, a path to the attacker. Some of those things are totally, totally untrue. Um, I can talk, I'm happy to talk about some of the misconceptions around S bombs at some point, but, um, I guess my, to answer your question, uh, it really depends on if an S bomb is difficult to generate, depending on what it is. Um, do they have the source code available? Like you would imagine, right? Like, oh, of course they would have the source code available that they always don't. <laughs> There's actually, it happens where companies get acquired or whatever, and 
uh, they don't have access to source anymore for some reason. I don't mm -hmm. think it's the most common thing in the world, but it is possible. And so in that scenario, you're dealing with a much harder problem. Um, so in terms of generating one for things that you're like actively working on, I mean, there are countless tools that can create a software bill of materials for you from, you know, vendors that we all, we all know, um, like that exists in like software component analysis or, um, you know, static analysis, testing tools, all of those things have, have S bomb creation capabilities. So, um, as well as, you know, some, even some of the CI CD pipeline tools and things like that can, can make that pro process, uh, pretty easy. So right. it's a matter of like <clears throat> choosing the, choosing to buy into like the ecosystem of creating a software bill of materials, managing that, keeping it up to date, having a process, having a workflow and all of that. That's like where I think the, the overhead is, but, but here's what we forget. I mean, this is equally as beneficial for the manufacturers as it is the, their downstream clients. Number one, they have third-party risk from suppliers that they're getting things from, whether that's open source components or things that they're paying for, like, you know, um, especially in OTICS, you know, a lot of folks are using like VXWorks and things like that for mm -hmm. real-time operating systems. So like, they don't own that, right? They, they didn't make that. So having an S-bomb for that, um, as well as that this now will allow them to be proactive when it comes to things like um, vulnerability, um, identification, vulnerability management, something that's been coined as VEX, you know, vulnerability and exploitation. Um, you can also then start deriving and extrapolating all kinds of other interesting things like, you know, risk tracking and open source license compliance and all these other things uh, once you have uh, access to that data. So it's not just a, it's not just like these pesky, <laughs> downstream clients who want, who want to like make everyone's life difficult. This is actually a really, really, um, important thing for the manufacturers that will make their lives easier in the long run. Um, right. so yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I can almost see some vendors maybe pushing back against providing one, maybe out of liability concerns or, you know, but there are some good use cases for, as you mentioned, the, the vendor to provide for one, maybe this leads into the misconceptions um, discussion that you mentioned, but do you, are, are you hearing about vendors kind of pushing back against providing one, even in, if they have the capability to do so? Um, I guess I would say it's, if they have the ability to do so, I haven't heard a ton of friction there per mm -hmm. se. Um, it's really been more around getting a software bill of materials when there isn't one is, okay. is like the bigger ask. I yep. think, um, quite frankly, that, that'd be a, a, a great question to ask, to ask some of them. I mean, I've been privy to some conversations and I've heard some things, but that's a small, you know, that's not a, to extrapolate the handful of conversations I've had to the entire market would right. maybe not be, uh, uh, totally appropriate, but I think generally speaking, um, it's, uh, the, the reluctance is around more like having to go through the process and get one than it is having it not being willing to give it because we have it's we act like we have these contracts have agreements in them we have non-disclosure agreements we have all of this contractual language we have you know all of these things already exist um so it's not like this is a you know a wild a wildly wild deviation from a like t's and c's and contractual perspective necessarily now i'm no lawyer but uh um, I think that it's really more about if we don't have it, getting it for you is the challenge, not less so if we, if we yeah. do giving it to you. So, so as I mentioned, uh, your DEF CON talk, a, a big part of it was kind of the, you know, bringing this into the ICS and OT world. And, you know, can you mm -hmm. talk about oh, the, the, the importance of these as compared to kind of a traditional, in a, a traditional IT use case? I mean, why? is it more significantly important in industrial circles to have an S bomb? Um, yeah. What are some of those reasons? Yeah. It's really around visibility is like, mm -hmm. I think the number one thing, <clears throat> I mean, you have, there's a, there's countless tools that can provide visibility in the it world. Um, also, when you think about like windows, everybody knows what's on windows. Like, no, everyone knows what binaries exist on windows, what configuration yeah. files, like everybody knows what those are. So, if something new pops up or whatever, there is a, there is an army of vendors and tools and capabilities out there that can tell you 
what that thing is, how long it's been around, is it secure, is it not, does it, does it, has it been signed, like whatever, we can do all of that for you. And I just find it kind of crazy that we're worried about, um, you know, Steve in accounting or Mary in HR's Windows laptop uh, more than we're worried about like a programmable logic controller or something. Now, the flip side of that is PLCs hopefully are, are harder to get access to because they're downstream. Um, and, right. and certainly compromising Steve in accounting or Mary in HR could lead to a very big problem for the entire corporation. I'm totally aware of that. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not naive to that fact. But the but the point remains, um, these these devices are serving incredibly critical functions, whether they be um, in nuclear power plants or building weapon systems or empowering utility companies serving tens to hundreds of thousands of people. And it's just kind of crazy that, you know, I know the example I gave in the um, in the talk was, you know, here's a list of the ingredients or bill of materials for a red wagon um, and we don't have a list of ingredients or bill of materials for a programmable logic controller. And that doesn't exactly seem to align logically. Um, it's nuts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, that's, that's the, that's really the piece there is, you know, is getting the visibility. And once you have that visibility, then you can, you can extrapolate and, and do all kinds of interesting things with that data once you have it. Um, so that's the, you know, from, from that's like the big difference, I think, is just that we, we don't, we're, we have nowhere near the same kind of visibility um, in, in these kind of devices and, and environments. Right. Because, I mean, I would imagine, you know, a lot of OT and ICS devices don't support agents, aren't kicking out a lot of telemetry. And, Correct. you know, if you have that kind of, you know, how the bread's made kind of thing. And as far as a list of ingredients, it's, it's a big edge that might not exist right now. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that's, um, that's one of the problems is you agents aren't really a possibility in the overwhelming majority of cases here. Um, which is, which is obviously why clarity was created, um, to, to provide visibility without an agent to a lot of these different things. Um, but you really have to go about this from an inside out perspective, um, to get to get access to this data, which in, which involves getting the binaries or getting the firmware or getting you know whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. given you know given the particular device. So yeah, that's that's the big issue is you can't you can't install things on these operating systems for or device types rather uh, and operating systems depending right. on what it is. So yeah, getting getting telemetry and getting access to that data is just uh, it's a completely different paradigm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm relatively new to ICS security. And one of the things that stands out for me is that these old vulnerabilities are popping up all the time. And it's, you know, code that was written 15, 20 years ago, these devices are still in the field. And, you know, you've got more researchers looking at it now, you've got more hackers looking at it now, and some attacks are exposing some of these vulnerabilities. And I would imagine that, you know, an SBOM would go a long way to help with vulnerability management and, you know, patch management updates, et cetera, if, if possible. Oh, I mean, absolutely. You have, I mean, the, the, the term here is, uh, in, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that I don't really, you don't hear of this term a lot, even in these circles, really. Uh, and I don't really know why that is. It's not like everyone hears about zero days, right? They're sexy, mm -hmm. they're cool. No one knows about them. You know, some awesome hacker and researcher found a zero day and now he's hacking an iPhone or the latest version of Windows or like whatever it is. End days are number one, significantly more prevalent. And number two are impacting all of these devices. And so when I say end day, I mean a vulnerability that exists has existed for some time, but is not, that is like generally not known to be present on a given device. And so if we look, if we look at one data set to examine this scenario, the national vulnerability database, right? It's totally unreasonable to expect the national vulnerability database to have every single product ever created known to man in its database, as well as understand all of the software components that are present in those devices, yep. as well as understand 
if there are vulnerabilities associated with those components. Like that's never going to happen. And that's fine because that's an unreasonable expectation anyways. But the, the number of devices that fit that bill are, it, 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 quite frankly, it's basically every device. I mean, I mean, aside from like Windows devices that are very well understood, but where where we don't have visibility to things in the in the greater market does not have visibility to things, IoT, medical embedded systems, like all that stuff. Right. I mean, what we have found already in in our, you know, our short journey thus far is on average you'll find ten times as many vulnerabilities for a given device. Uh, than exist in the national vulnerability database. And, mm-hmm. and in some, I mean, in some cases, there's zero de- vulnerabilities for a particular device because it's just not known. It's just not it, they're not tracking it for a million different reasons. So, you know, vulnerability identification, management, and tracking is is definitely the the use case that people get most excited about, um, which is which is which is great. Um, but the What's interesting, you can do some really cool things once you understand a particular end day vulnerability exists, then you can leverage things like Shodan and go determine, is this vulnerability being, uh, does it appear to be being leveraged or other like, you know, other tools that give you really big internet level telemetry. Um, And (laughs) what I can tell you is almost all of them are. Um, But therein lies the problem in a lot of ways is we don't see it. Because we don't know, right? Um, now, once again, this is this is this is an area where a, a, a company like like Clarity does a great job of giving that level of visibility to. But um, if we're talking about like other kinds of you know other kinds of networks where maybe you guys aren't in and things like that, um, it's it can be a it can be you know a really a really tough thing to identify and see because we're really just not looking. Right. I mean, in your excuse me, in your talk, you you brought up as an example, Heartbleed and mm-hmm. just kind of the mess that that was in terms of just finding um, everywhere that OpenSSL lived because it was in, embedded almost everywhere. Every, you know, a lot of products use it. And, you know, if it's not documented, you don't know what's there. It just adds hours and hours and cycles to, you know, to your work as when something like Heartbleed pops up, that was just such a, a major vulnerability at the time. Yeah, I mean, that was a months long party for us. Yeah. <laughs> um and and we we weren't alone, so you know, uh, there there should be no additional sympathy for 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 me and us. Um that was that was almost everybody. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, it was a uh, it was a really big challenge. I think I, I referenced the, a a conversation I had uh, with someone who was um on the on the on the tip of the spear there. And they had said that they had to email 635 people internally to help determine, you know, what right. versions of OpenSSL were used where. That's insane. And I mean, it is insane, right? And it is like, it's not ha ha funny, but it's like ridiculous funny kind of thing, right? And it's like, um, like that was a relatively long time ago. What, what, what 2014, I think, or something like that. So mm-hmm. and I, I don't know that things have gotten much better, uh, which I think is maybe the more unfortunate thing right uh, so yeah it's a um it's a it's it's a challenge and I, and I think a lot of the the challenge here comes from we're not putting all this data in like the same place we're using all these different tools that are great right like a vericode or a you know synopsis or black duck or snick okay. or um you know uh, maybe like like tenables involved somewhere rapid like whatever it is um and these are all like clearly great security tools um but like the 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 trick here is and like what we're you know building at netrise is this ability to bring that data together and have it all in one place so you can have like clear visibility and understanding of what's going on so you know, pulling data from all those different places and, and, and getting it in one spot is like, can be the tricky part, especially when you're talking about different um, device types, operating systems, processor mm-hmm. architectures, file systems, um, you know, binary types, like all, all of that. But uh, that's what I think is really required here to make a, a substantive difference. Yeah. I'm really interested to get your, your take on um, 
some of the U.S. government activity that's happened, and, and granted, a lot of it's reactive to Oldsmar mm-hmm. and Colonial, et cetera. Um, but especially the executive order that was signed, I believe, in May, yeah. um, calls out OT and ICS, and especially S bombs. It, it got a bunch of mentions, and you know, explaining the 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 importance of them. How much of a game changer is is that going to be? Do you think in in this respect? I mean. Being someone who's spent a fair amount of my life working for the government, um, mm-hmm. it's a really impressive thing about that executive order. Um, a lot of times, those they're pretty toothless, right? Um, I don't think that's the case here. Uh, so I'm part of the NTIA uh, Software Bill of Materials Working Group that was uh, previously led up by Alan Friedman who recently just jumped over to CISA. And um, so he'll continue doing the amazing things he's doing. Um, and so uh, that 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 group, um, you know, had some impact on that. Um, and, and, and that's why I think you saw SBOM mentioned so many times. But, uh, you know, they've put, they had clear objectives in, in terms of, okay, what are the, you know, what like standards are we going to have in the first like 60 days or whatever? Okay, right. done. What, what, uh, what's the minimum requirements for an S bomb going to be? That's came out. And now, uh, I might mess up these dates slightly, but maybe you have it in front of you. But it's like in the next 12 months, like you need to have a plan. And then the next like 18 to 24 months, you need to start like uh, getting, getting an S bomb or requesting them and, and showing that you have them and things like that. And so there's real, there's real, teeth and real things happening here. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the colonial, it's actually, it's actually like, this was actually driven from solar winds, but then colonial just happened right around the executive order happening. True. Right. Um, so that was really just a kind of a crazy coincidence. Um, it, I think it certainly, uh, helped probably push things in like the OTICS side a bit more. Um, but, uh, this was being driven out of, you know, my understanding is the, the software supply chain ta- attacks. Um, and, and a lot of that. And then, and then colonial also happened and it was just like, okay, we'll add, we'll add that in there too. Yeah. Um, so, um, if there was ever a good time for a, uh, a, a, an OT or ICS attack, I guess that would have been it. Um, you know, right before the executive order came out so they could add some, and maybe it was already going to be in there. You know, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't the guy behind the keyboard writing it, but, um, I would imagine that that, um, caused a bit of alteration in, in some of the language that was in there. Yeah, I mean, whether it was coincidence or not, I mean, it was just a crazy first six months of the year with you yeah. know, the, these mainstream, these attacks bringing um, critical infrastructure security to the mainstream. And, you know, as devastating as they, they may have been, it, it's also probably a positive just to kind of raise the awareness of the state of things and, you know, what can happen, even a tangential attack like Colonial against the IT um, against the billing systems forced them to shut down production. And it's something we've never really seen uh, to that scale anyway, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think at that scale, for sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk in like IC, the ICS OT world, as you're very aware, I'm sure, around this concept of like a cyber Pearl Harbor kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And um, I don't know what that needs to be at this point. <laughs> Um, we, it, I, I really don't, I mean, it's like, can things be worse? Of course, um, things can always be worse, like coordinated attacks that, you know, take down a pipeline and transportation and food and logistics and energy or like whatever, um, would, would be that I would imagine. But I mean, we've had all of those things happen like individually, yeah. um, you know, in this idea, uh, you know, I, I just think I think the problem with a lot of this stuff is it's so ephemeral, um, and it's not until something like a gas pipeline happens where you have a a ton of people losing money mm-hmm. and b impacting like the general population, right? I mean, you have people putting gasoline in grocery bags, which is just like a whole, I mean, just there was amazing a, images that that we there were some absolutely. I mean, there's been a lot of amazing images <laughs> in the last yeah. 18 months in general for yeah. for people you really start to wonder if um, we all evolved at the same rate. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I suppose I generally subscribe to when these things happen, it's, it's, it's never good, but it's like bringing awareness to the problem. I mean, if they never happened, that'd be great. That means we like, we all had our stuff together, you right. know, but we clearly don't. So like at some point you need some, you need some catalyst to drive change. Cause like without mm -hmm. it, it's just not going to happen. So, and I mean, geez, you don't want to be that sacrificial lamb. Right. And it's like, who wants to be the person responsible for making the decision where whatever someone yeah. dies or a business goes under or whatever it is so that the greater good can be recognized in the future. I, I don't know. Would I volunteer for that? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, but that's what's required. And I think right. we all recognize that, especially those of us who have worked in the government, been in the military, worked for like, whatever you, you, you just realize that this is a slow moving machine and, uh, without, without a significant boom, um, whether that be uh, a physical or cyber, uh, variety change is going to be slow. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time just kind of for people that aren't familiar, um, talking about, you, you mentioned a S bomb generation earlier, just maybe going into a, a, that a little bit more and, and how these things are consumed and operationalized. I mean, what, what do they look like? Are they spreadsheets? Is it something that's ingestible by other tools? A little bit of both way. Take me into that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, um, they can be, they can exist. Uh, I mean, you could certainly have one as a spreadsheet. Um, the problem there is, you know, how, how you, you want it to be as machine readable as possible, right. right. For dissemination purposes. Um, so can you email an S bomb? Can you put it in a word document? Can you put it on a billboard? Can you trail it from a plane flying in the sky? Like, sure. You can do all these things. Um, I don't know how scalable and machine readable some of those solutions are. So what, what has happened is there's basically three formats, um, that exist for S bomb generation. Um, Cyclone DX, SWID, and SPDX. And so they all have generally the same field of requirements, things like that. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I prefer Cyclone DX. It has a ton of amazing documentation, um, a, a ton of tools. You can go to the uh, Cyclone DX website. I think it's just cyclonedx.org. They list out all the use cases they address. They list out tools that can be used to generate and consume things. Mm -hmm. I think they even have some tools that allow you to do cross mappings. So you can map between like Cyclone DX and SPDX and SWID and like all these different things. Um, and then in terms of like how they are um, stored and disseminated, typically it's like JSON or XML format. Um, so because everybody can, you know, read JSON and XML, like, you know, yep. whatever, via, via an API or just uploading a document or whatever. So um, now in terms of how they are generated from like a code base, there's a, like I said before, there's a ton of different ways you can do this. So if you're operating under the assumption you have source code or, or even you're working with the manufacturer, and here's, here's what I mean by the difference there. Uh, if you're given the source code, like you can, you can, you know, you can write some stuff that just gives you all the information, but maybe the manufacturer doesn't want to give you source code or whatever, or they don't want to give the tool source code or whatever, but they know, okay, we're using this component. It's this version. It's, you know, it has these libraries and these dependencies or like whatever it is. And they can like, just like put that in. Um, it's, it's not as, it's not like as good, but it's, you know, it, it, it can get you there. Right. Um, alternatively, you can go about this problem, the zero knowledge approach, which is, so say someone gives you a firmware image and you need to ascertain the components that are, that exist in that firmware image. Now you're talking about a problem mm -hmm. um, that, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, this will probably be like a quote to put on my headstone or something, but I, I underestimated the challenge of component identification. Um, it's a beast, uh, especially from a zero knowledge approach, because you can't rely on things you would normally rely on from like an authentication perspective. You can't look at hashes of a particular file and just assume that that is the hash because right. people, they recompile binaries, they, 
um, they might add something and not change the file name, or there's a, just a million reasons why like the normal ways in which we authenticate and validate software components does not work in this, in this scenario. Uh, things like, you know, let's take a stupid example, like, uh, like BusyBox, like BusyBox version, whatever, 1.1.1. Uh, let's say that's the file name. That, that is a very poor uh, data point to leverage to determine that's the actual component, right? Mm -hmm. You can just change the file name. You can name whatever yep. you want. So, right. I mean, you run into like a lot of that. And so the, I guess the way I've explained it to folks in the past is there's many scenarios wherein the data does not exist in the component in which you need to identify like the version or unique attributes of to figure out what it is. Meaning you might need to, you have to bring in data from somewhere else. Uh, so, okay, we know that uh, these, if these dependencies are present and we can ascertain, like uh, we can validate that like these parts of the code are the same as this part of the code and things like that. You can start to figure out what things are. Um, but now you're, that's like a much trickier problem. Right. Um, so uh, some, some vendors and some things make this a lot easier on you. You know, they're using like maybe an off the shelf version of uh, Linux or embedded Linux or like whatever it is. So like things are fairly well documented. Some vendors go so far as to literally include like a text file or something like that, that has a list of the components and dependencies in there. Those vendors, I love you. Um, <laughs> you you're, 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 that's wonderful. Um, and so, you know, it's just, the, there's no, like that, like therein lies the problem, right? There is not a consistent, way to do it and that's the kind of that's the crazy thing right imagine if we imagine if we just let people build cars however they want right and we were just like okay like what's what's this thing in the car and like oh that thing we call that the um we call that the flux capacitator oh, okay cool what well what do you guys call it? Oh, that, this is just like a v6 engine like why do you why are you guys calling them like two wildly different th like it's um you know, it's, it, it, we just, there's no standards. Um, and that's kind of crazy. Well, I, I guess I take that back. There are standards and there are like a million frameworks and uh, compliance things out there, but none that are universally adhered to from like a naming convention perspective or right. a versioning, like the number of permutations of versions that exist is like staggering. You know, you have like, we're going to start with a number. We're going to have, there's no letters. We're going to start with a letter. There's no numbers. There's like, it's, so you just, it's a, it's kind of a crazy problem in that way where you like, you think like logically in your brain, okay, I'm going to, I can figure out what these things are. And it's not nearly as easy um, as, as, as one would think. And that's, and by the way, this is why this is a problem for the manufacturers, right? They have the same problem. Yeah. Um, like developers come in and name things different things and they hire new people and people leave and things aren't well documented or whatever, just normal problems that, you know, exist uh, with this kind of stuff. So. Reminds me of all the the different names we have for APT groups or malware. Every vendor gives them their own, uh, their own nickname yeah. for the same group or the same piece of malware. Yeah. Yeah. They, that, that is, that's actually a very good uh, comparison, I think. Uh, let's talk about some of the misconceptions around um, SBOMs. You, you kind of hinted at it earlier. Um, I know a couple that you brought up in your talk, just basically, you know, giving an attacker a, a map of your network, for example, or, or just too much information um, that's valuable to them or, you know, disclosing IP, et cetera. Just kind of shoot some of those down because, you know, on the surface, it makes sense. But if you dig into it a little bit, it doesn't. Yeah, that's exactly right. So. The big one uh, we've heard is, you know, you're providing a roadmap to the attacker, which, you know, not to keep like belaboring this point, but for those of us that have been in the government and worked up against some of these APT groups, especially, um, it's just comical, right? That's just, it's just not accurate. Yeah. We, we act like getting access to this data is this like grand challenge. <laughs> it's, it's just not, I mean, because here's the thing, if you really want access to it, you can just buy it. You can just go buy the device and then 
request, I mean, you can just, there's a million, you can reverse engineer it. There's a million ways to get access to this data. Um, now to my point, what I said earlier, it's not always like the easiest thing in the world to figure out some of these things, but, uh, but you can, you can get it and figure it out if, if, if you, if you want to is really the point. Right. And so what we're really doing here is not giving a roadmap to the defender. That's the, we're, we're hampering visibility of the people who need it most, not giving visibility to the people who are trying to hurt us. It's, it's kind of a, I, I don't know where that mentality comes from. I don't know if it's, if it's because they don't want to put in the effort to, to create the S-bomb. So they throw like these red herrings out there. Um, I don't know, but it's just a, it's just a factually inaccurate statement. And that's, that's kind of that. Um, from a, there's a question around intellectual property disclosure um, that some people have had concerns about. Uh, and, and I will say this, um, which is kind of contrarian, but there are scenarios, I think, where making available like all of the components that you may use, like let's, let's say it's a, um, like the automotive industry is wildly competitive, right? Like yeah. things aren't that different between a BMW and a, you know, whatever, a Toyota or Lexus or something like that. And so maybe they figured out a way to make something much more efficient and, and, and whatever. And they've done that in software, which would, you know, almost certainly be the case in, for a lot of these things. And so they don't, they don't want to, they don't want to document like what, what it is they're using. And maybe it's, maybe they figured out, man, this open source uh, component can really make a big difference for us here. And everyone else didn't figure that out yet. That's, that's act, like, that's a, there's a, that's a reasonable statement. Yeah. Um, that's, it's actually a very reasonable statement. I, I think that is by far the exception um, and not the rule. So that would just be my point there. Uh, overwhelmingly, there's a not an intellectual property disclosure here. But once again, we have this is why we have non-disclosure agreements and we have all of these things. And certain industries are much more sensitive around this, um, automotive being one of them. I actually don't find the ICS and OT industry to actually be sensitive about that. I don't think that's their concern at all. The OT ICS industry, I've not heard the intellectual property disclosure issue brought up at all. I have heard it in automotive and I do... I'm, I, I get it uh, to some extent, but once again, it's, it should not be the re it's, it, we should not be able to derive from that. Well, no S bombs for anybody then. Right. Cause you can right. even say like, Hey, we can give you 90% of this. I can't give you the other 10% because that's uh, whatever a trade secret or something. Cause, cause here's the thing. I think I gave this analogy in my, um, in my talk, right. We've all seen those amazing videos where like the guys or girls or people or whoever it is, like put on their, those glasses or they, like colorblind and now they can see like colors and everyone starts crying and there's like blues yeah. everywhere and it's great um you'd rather have 90 percent visibility than zero percent visibility you know so like we don't we don't need to throw the baby out the bathwater. perfect is the enemy of good whatever analogy people like here uh something is better than nothing so that's that uh the last piece around will this increase my licensing costs i mean you if <laughs> you need to be aware of what's in your code in, in the licensing requirements you have. So if you are aware of those sooner, then you can address them sooner. Um, and that's really that. So, yeah, um, that's a good subtle point though. I guess one of the things I would say, um, it's pretty surprising. Some of the things you find, even from very large companies who you would think would have a very robust you know, security or even just software development life cycle where they would be taking into account things like that, just mm -hmm. because you would think they'd be super concerned and aware of the legal implications that could potentially arise if it was identified they were using whatever, whatever, some component that uh, they're not giving appropriate um, acknowledgement to, but that's just not the case. And so that's where you can also see some, that's where, so you, then you can easily understand, right? Based on that, where there could be some reluctance and apprehension because right. maybe they do, maybe they do know. Um, and uh, they, they don't want everyone else to know. I would like to just like focus on like one last point real quick, if I could, because uh, sure. I know this has also been like, a, um, you, know, you know, you hate to make a mountain out of a molehill here kind of thing, but like, I guess I would say contentious around like, okay, great. I have a software bill of materials, like, like now what? Um, and so it's, it's this idea around, um, 
having this level of visibility is really the important thing. And it's like, are, are S-bombs preventative? Are they stopping anything? No, they are not. In the same way that logs, like security logs aren't stopping anything, uh, passive sensors aren't stopping anything necessarily, um, vulnerability scans aren't stopping anything, SIMs aren't stopping anything. So this is just another tool in the toolbox, another weapon in the arsenal that we can use to get visibility to things that we're not using yet. We can operationalize this data. We can enrich this data with other sources. We can do a, a, a million things once we have this data. So I just wanted to mention that because I know there's been lots of chatter on you know, places like Twitter and other conferences and things like that where people are like, well, if I have this, what good is it me? What good is it to me if I can't like, if it's not stopping anything? And it's like, if that was the barrier to entry, <laughs> um, half of the security tools and half of just about anything wouldn't exist. Um, it's not all about prevention. We have to start with visibility. And then once we get visibility, we can start moving that um, down down the line to a, to a prevention-based um, uh, strategy. All right. That's a good place to leave it. But before we sign off there, I have to ask you one question. In your talk, there's a great picture in one of the slides of you and Chuck Norris. I have to hear that story if, uh, <laughs> if it doesn't... Uh, if it's if it's possible to share yeah no it is um you know it's a really funny thing that picture has has is i guess fairly legendary at this point but uh whenever i started netrise i was like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna get rid of it i'm not gonna use it in presentations anymore um and uh i was doing a presentation for a group of folks in japan and the guy who i was um doing it for was like, well, where's the picture of you and Chuck Norris? <laughs> and I was like, well, I was going to retire it. He's like, you can't retire the picture of you and Chuck Norris. Like that's the that's the best part. And I was like, all right. So, anyways, that's uh, let's see what year that was. Um, uh, 2007. Yeah, in uh, in Iraq at a uh, outside of um Haditha Dam, um, at a outpost called uh, Cop Ellis, Command Outpost Ellis, which has been demailed forever ago. But um, he came out there as part of like a, you know, like a USO tour sure. kind of thing. But what's, but what, here's the impressive thing about that. Like we were like in the middle of nowhere. It, it, it wasn't quite a forward operating base, um, which is where I was operating out of mostly at the time. But a command outpost is still like pretty, like those can get pretty hairy. Mm -hmm. And so his willingness to be there was really it was really awesome. Um, and he was like, he was super, super gracious with his time and everything. Um, and, uh, one of the, my favorite things he did was he signed, um, two artillery shells, uh, Walker and Texas Ranger. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was pretty, That's um, great. that was, uh, that was pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, so that was that was that was that's kind of an amazing thing. So I've used that as like my icebreaker and my uh, introduction photo for quite some time. Um, so yeah, yeah, you you definitely have to keep that in your in your talks. All <laughs> yeah. right, great place to leave it, Tom. Thank you so much for for coming on. I really appreciate. it. I think this was a, a very important conversation, and uh, you know, feel free to come back again. Yeah, thanks for having me, and I, I'd be thrilled to do so. Thanks a lot. All right, great. See you later. <laughs>